Hi, I'm Greg. Um, every year I say I'm going to give a technical talk, and then something happens and I can't. Um, this year, no exception. Um, I just had, I was here at the ninth, or the second one, I got a notice on my phone saying, remember your trip nine years ago with me and Boris, staying at their house, playing with the bees. It's a good conference. Um, anyway, let's talk about security stuff. Um, there's been a lot of talk and a lot of discussion about different security issues recently, so let's talk about process. Wonderful. Somebody complained that this talk is all about process and not technical things. Um, yeah, sorry. But the good thing is, I get to say this once, it's recorded, everybody gets to refer to it again, like my CV talk, like my last one. So I get to have fun. Um, again, disclaimer, it's just me. Hopefully I can get people to agree with me, not the Linux Foundation's point of view, not any other kernel developers, just me. Um, why talk about this now? The CRA is coming for the EU, and as an EU resident, and hopefully citizen one day, um, this is really important to me. Uh, the rules involved with the CRA are good, or the idea behind it is good, is to provide um, liability for the software inside a device that ships. Just like you can't ship a toy with toxic paint, you shouldn't be able to ship a toy with toxic software. Really good. Uh, but the implementation is actually really horrible. It actually is going to cut off, if as written right now and approved right now, if not changed, it's going to remove all use of open source in the EU. That's really real. We're not, I'm not kidding. Uh, Linux Foundation has made a, published a number of things about it. Eclipse Foundation, Mozilla, there is no open source community that disagrees with this. Um, the German Automotive Association came out and said this. French telecoms came out and said this. When the French telecoms and the German automotive associations agree, you know something's up. Um, <laughs> hopefully something changes in this. Um, there's been a lot of talk about how contributions work and how open source is recognized and whatnot. But a lot of the document also talks about security. And everybody keeps ignoring the security issues. They don't really understand how security really works. One fun thing is that if, an open, if you find a uh, security bug, you must notify it to the project, and the project has to fix it within 24 hours. <laughs> uh, another fun thing is you cannot ship a device with any known vulnerabilities. And I respond with known by whom? <laughs> um, if, it's not, if it's known by you when you ship it, you're just not going to pay attention. If it's known by me, well, I can't tell you. But uh, it'll never end. Um, anyway, CRA is coming. It's important. Um, also, I get this every couple months. Companies keep asking to join the kernel security team. I can explain why that doesn't make any sense. And here's the other fun one. People want to know, give me all the early security notices. Companies keep asking for that. And I'll explain why we've never had that, why we can never have that, and why it's a really bad idea. Oh, and Boris, and Thomas, hardware embargoes are a pain. I'll talk about that. Hopefully they're going away. All right. I'm going to zip through this, but I have to show how this developed. It's a kernel size, 36 million lines of code. Um, nobody runs that. You only run 5 to 10%. Um, everybody runs the scheduler, though. So when it's hard to get this, <laughs> it's hard to change the scheduler. It's good because everybody uses that. Um, but everybody runs a different part of that. So you're running about 2 million, maybe 3 million lines of code. Uh, your phone's running 3.5 million lines of code, and 3 million of that is out of tree. It's Linux like. Um, anyway. Running about nine changes an hour, been pretty constant the past couple of years. We go up and down, 10, eight and a half, nine. All is good, kernel's doing well. Um, the new release model, the EU people didn't actually understand this. This is new as of 2004. <laughs> uh, release every three months, all releases are stable. It's that simple. Uh, in 2007, a number of people in this room, we all got together in Cambridge, came up with the rule, we will not break user space. We want you to always be able to upgrade the kernel and never fear for this. There's been an addendum to this. <laughs> um, but normally when caught, we will fix it. So we want you to be able to upgrade the kernel. You should always be able to just update the kernel and it all works. People are like, oh no, what we have, it just doesn't work for our devices. And then you talk to them and it's like, because they have three million out of tree code, lines of out of tree code. Um, I will show, um, Pixel team has talked about this. The Pixel 6, which was released three years ago, has booted successfully and runs properly on Linus's every single RC release, and it has 300 out of tree drivers. It works just fine. If Pixel team can do this, anybody can do this. Um, you should always be able to update to a new kernel, and it just works. It can be done. 
Um, again, version numbers mean nothing. People still ask me, when are we going to have a development tree? Come on. Um, that was a long time ago. Um, anyway, when it gets too big, Linux just bumps the number. Every couple of years, we'll go to seven, a couple more years. Um, again, do a release. Linux is RCs every week. Do a new release. And then during that three-month cycle, we have stable releases. And we have stable. Patches go from there to stable. I do the stable releases, et cetera, et cetera. Um, rules for stable. And actually, this is kind of important. Um, must be in Linus's tree. That was something new that other teams really hadn't done before, which has saved our butt so many times. Um, it has to be in Linus's tree in order to go to stable tree. So when developers object, saying, I don't want this patch. It's not good enough to go into stable. Your instant response is, but it was good enough to go to Linus's tree? Um, come on. If it's in Linus's tree, it's good enough to go to stable. Although, where's Mark? Yes, I agree that sometimes the dependencies are messed up. So. Yes. Um, anyway, there's the rules. Long-term kernel, one a year. Pick one, the last one. I think it's going to be 6.6. Six. We were doing the math earlier today. Um, depends on when we do a release. At least two years, sometimes longer. Um, I can publicly say, yeah, we'll do four years. It's OK. Um, people, that suddenly got noticed last week from a talk John gave, Corbett gave. Um, we announced that in February. Press didn't pick up on it. Anyway, all is good. Um, this is interesting. The long-term kernels actually are very, very rapid. Lots of changes happen. Lots of different things happen. Uh, running at 36 changes, 6.1 kernel. It's all good. Um, these are all patches from Linux tree. Over time, it slows down, so the less number of patches apply to older trees. But because it's more work. It's always more work to patch older kernels than it is newer kernels. You need more experienced developers to maintain older kernels, which is the opposite of what a lot of management thinks. Um, it's harder to keep older kernels alive. Just don't do it. Um, every lease is stable. We should never have a fear to upgrade. OK. Questions about development model? Yeah, that was easy. All right. I talk about this in great detail in an old blog post, too. Um, now let's get to new stuff. People don't realize this. 80% at least of all the world's servers do not run an enterprise kernel. They are not a paid kernel. It's the community kernels. Debian runs the world. And the real person that runs the world is Android. Android is at what, 4 billion? Everything else is a rounding error. Android runs kernel.org kernels, sometimes really old ones, heavily patched, but they're not running enterprise kernels. So because of this, when chip companies or where corporate, when governments come and say, oh, we need to talk to this company, they're running Linux. They're, they're in charge of Linux, like Red Hat likes to say they're Linux. They're not Linux. They're Linux, a portion of Linux. Now, their margins, their businesses are good. They make good money. It's big. But the huge percentage is the community. So intercompany communication, like Intel tried to do with Spectre Meltdown, just doesn't work. And the community cannot sign NDAs. Community can't be held liable for anything. Well, the EU's trying to hold the community liable. Um, but in general, the community cannot sign NDAs. The more people realize that this is what the world looks like today, the easier it'll be to understand how we work. Please, if you can't take anything, just take this away. Again, Debian, at least 80%. I think more. This is what people will admit to me. So Debian does good stuff. And Debian runs the stable kernels. So let's talk about the kernel security team. Um, we, this is reactive, not proactive. We react to problems reported to us. There's people doing some really, really good proactive security, Gustavo, um, other people here um, doing really good react or proactive stuff. The talk yesterday about the LSM stuff, that's good proactive stuff. The kernel needs both. You can't just say, what is up with security? Security is lots of different stuff. So I'm going to talk about reactive stuff. So the team started in 2005. Somebody posted the mailing list, hey, how do I report a security bug? We didn't really have a real way to do this. Thanks to Steve. Um, there's an email thread if you want to look it up. He said, how do we do this? So Chris Wright, who was at OSDL at the time, now is what, CTO of Red Hat, um, came up with a patch and added security contact information to the kernel after a couple months and got it merged. And this is the patch. Uh, that's where it's submitted. Um, 2005 was an interesting year. 2005, the stable kernel started, uh, security team started, and Git started. We like grew up in 2005. Um, we became a real project. But the interesting thing that Chris did, and the lawyers behind who did this work, was they added this clause at the bottom of it. 
said, the security team cannot, or they're on our individuals, and we cannot enter into any NDAs. And that is the thing that it saved us, thanks to the work that Chris did and others did a long time ago. And I'll talk more about that later. Um, we're not a formal body. We're individuals. Um, there's a number of people in this room that are on this group, and let's talk a little bit more about that. Um, alias, it's just an email alias. It's a couple of us. Um, we do not represent any company. We cannot talk about what we get to any company. Um, somebody on the group was talking about with their company, and they got removed. Um, there's never been a leak, knock on wood, from us in all the years. Um, there were some problems originally with some email many, many years ago, but that's been all fixed up. Um, but we're individuals, don't represent the company, and we can't enter any to any agreements with anybody, which is good. All we do is triage reports. Get the bug, we look at it, say, oh, who is this for? Drag in the right maintainers. We work to get it fixed as soon as possible. Get emerged in the Linux tree, get emerged in the stable tree. That's it. Move on to the next thing. That's all we do. And we get a report to maybe three a week, maybe. Depends on it. We're getting a lot of spam from SysBot these days. Where everybody wants to have a report. Um, mostly we just work to get it done and fix it. And that's all we are. Not a special team of people, handful of people. Um, that's all we do. If you are brought in enough times, we add you to the list. So you don't want to be added to the list. Jens, I don't know how you've gotten away with not being on the list. <laughs> um, you're like one more report away. <laughs> it has been. You guys have done a great job. <laughs> That's why you're not on the list. So um, that gives you an indication. So look at, I, I mean, IO Ring has supposedly had all these security issues. And overall, no, it hasn't. IO Ring has been really good. They're doing a really good job. But it's a, it's a round trip. We just add them and go. So the number of people on that group are basically there because we've been added enough made it easier. They're volunteers for this stuff. We purge the list every once in a while. People go on maternity leave. People change jobs, things like that. That's it. We're not anything interesting. Just fix the bug, move on. Uh, we don't have any embargoes. We won't deal with that. Uh, we did a 14-day one. I think somebody in this room asked for us to do that one. Um, but that's about it. Maybe seven days. We really don't want to do it. And we don't do any announcements. We don't tell anybody anything. It's up to the submitter if they want to say anything. We do try and keep the change log for commits neutral. Um, people have noticed that when patches hit Linus's tree that didn't hit a public mailing list, that might be a security issue. Hopefully, we now know how to wrap around that. Um, there's some automatic tools. They gave a talk at Plumbers a couple of years ago. Like, what are these 10 patches? Oh, they, oh yeah, that's what that was. Um, but no announcements. We don't tell anybody anything. We're up to the submitter. They can do what they want. This is how we work. It's been working really well since 2005. That's it. And let's talk. Linus talks about this way back in 2008. Because people were getting mad. People were, I was seeing these stable updates with bug fixes in it. And people didn't know why. They wanted to say, tell me what the bug is. And Linus, in his very kind way of working, you guys can read that, um, he basically said, we don't know. Bugs are bugs. Let's fix them and move on. And um, People were saying, no, you must explicitly call out security bugs. And he's like, no, it's not going to work out that way. Because the big one is if it should be trustworthy. I mean, there's an infamous TTY bug I keep talking about for years that I fixed, and I caused before that, there was a security bug in it. It gave root to all rel kernels for three years. Um, I didn't realize that. Now, because I didn't, I just thought it was a bug fix. I fixed it and moved on. I can't audit every patch that goes in to determine if it is or is not a security bug for a whole bunch of reasons I'll talk about. But um, the big thing is, if we do mark them, then you're falsely misled that others are not. We don't want that. Fix the bug, move on. Linus says, they're all fixes, all important. He says new features, too, and they're all good. And what's unclear about that? The thread went on for a little bit longer. <laughs> um, I got the links to it. It's kind of fun. Um, and somehow, of course, it started with me. <laughs> um, here's how you report security bugs. Talk about how you do it. Tell us what is there. Ideally, you'll come to us with a fix. We get lots of them where people say, here's the bug, and I think it's around line whatever in this file. Like, Great, send a fix. You can test it. I don't know why more people don't do that. Um, we're trying to push people more to do that. Because then they get credit for the fix as well as reporting it. It's good. That's how we work. Um, again, the policy in the kernel, 
all bugs could be a security issue. We don't really know. Somebody, um, a German car manufacturer, said, okay, we're going to audit every single stable patch and see if it is or is not a security fix. I'm like, wonderful. Go ahead and do that. Let's see how you do. Talk to them a year later. They're like, we gave up. <laughs> they could not keep in track. They could not keep on top of it. They know they fixed a bug. So they came to the conclusion, if we know it fixes a bug, why not take it? doesn't matter if it is or isn't a security bug. And Google proved this. I talked about this in the past. Google proved that 95% of all reported CVEs, CVEs don't mean anything, um, are, were fixed by the stable kernels before they were ever reported. Now, a lot of this is due to the way Red Hat engineering policy of getting bug fixes into their kernels. They create a CVE for a bug fix that's already been done. The average date is 100 days in the past. But the other 5% were for out-of-tree Google code. All the major security issues that Google found were already fixed. Either we got lucky or we didn't. Either way, it's safe. And this is, Willie said this a bunch of times before, but let's publicly say this. I have this all the time. Everybody's afraid to take something. It might have a potential new bug. Our issue, our policy is, we know we fixed this bug as best as we could. Take the fix, and if it did cause problems, we'll fix it again. And a lot of these issues we see, a lot of these hardware issues we see, we like, oh yeah, we didn't get it quite right. Let's add a few more fixes on top. We take those and go. We have had a public, I don't think they ever said publicly, one company, very cl large cloud vendor, um, publicly said, oh, we took these, or they said they took these CVE fixes for a hardware bug, but didn't seem to really cause, fix the problem. We're like, yeah, because you've mixed the 20 patches after that. <laughs> you know, CVEs don't match to patches. So you have to take all the fixes. And we had an we actually, you tagged them saying these are fixes for those fixes and they never caught them. Again, if you fix, if we take the fix and it's broken, we'll take it. It's always better to do this. We're human, we'll always get it wrong. There'll always be a problem, but we're here to fix it. So please, always, always take it. Here's the big part. I don't know what 10% of that kernel tree you're using. It could be something different. It could be this part. It could be the core. It could not be the core. I don't know how you use it. I don't know what code you use. I don't know how you use this. Anything like that. And I don't want to. <laughs> Open source is not about dictating use. That's a really good thing. CRAs kind of might change that. But open source projects do not dictate use. We provide a tool that you can solve your problem. I mean, Linux is in keyboards. It's in space station. It's in robots, it's in ro uh, rockets, helicopters, mega super yacht stabilizers, um, cow milking machines. Um, it's everywhere. I don't know your use case. I don't want to know your use case. You know your use case. Take the fixes and go from there. And this was said really good recently by Ben. Um, he wrote a big, long article about it saying, ah, oh, here's how you found security fixes or security bugs. What makes a bug bit good for as far as the exploit goes? And it's really hard to figure out if it's really serious or not. And he, he goes through the steps of saying, hey, this really works good on my desktop. But in the cloud system, it didn't matter at all because it just wasn't even being used. And that's very important. This is a really interesting issue that um, companies don't understand and government regulators don't understand. We don't know your use case. Bugs could be a bug, not even an issue, or it could be a really, really serious issue to you. I'm not the one to tell you that. You know that the best. So to be fair, for the EU regulations, the companies are coming out and saying, we want to be responsible. We will take responsibility for our devices and our use cases, which is the proper solution. Because again, vulnerability remediation is hard. Um, yeah, fix it as soon as possible. Get it out to users quickly. It doesn't always work for hardware bugs. And hardware vendors, you think they're special? Um, the interesting thing about the CRA is hardware is really just firmware. It's really microcode. It's software. Um, they're going to have to fix these issues just as fast as we're going to fix these issues. One of the things is like if you're told a report, or you're told a security issue, you have to fix it in 24 hours, which is and crazy. They're like, okay, we'll knock it down to 72. Um, I get bug reports from hardware vendors that said, we found this problem in the chip. We're going to look at this. And it'll be 15 months. <laughs> um, this is going to hit them hard. <laughs> Which is good. I mean, they should be a little more vulnerable. Um, we've had a lot of problem with hardware issues. Um, as Boris mentioned, it makes a lot of people in this room very grumpy. We have encrypted lists. We, have, we don't want to set up NDAs, but we 
have cross-company and operating system coordination between us and Zen and the FreeBSDs. It works really well. Um, we intolerate t embargoes, but it's getting to be ridiculous. When somebody says, um, spin me up a mailing list for a problem we're going to fix in 15 months, I'm now refusing. Um, and that's not going to be OK. Uh, we have had some issues with the quality of these because we haven't been able to have good testing. So we're pushing back on the companies. If it's your hardware that's broken, you're going to have to be responsible for testing these better and take, take responsibility for that. Um, Boris did a great job. He took responsibility for all those issues found later. Some vendors don't. Think that. So um, this is going to slowly change. Um, I think we had a couple months ago five or six of these running at once. It was a nightmare. Um, it turned out one developer should have been on one of the other lists and wasn't, and we didn't realize it because we were all keeping track of different lists and trying to keep things siloed. It's just a nightmare. We're going to start stop having to do these um, and start treating hardware bug just as a normal bug. Linus has said, let's just treat it as a normal bug. Give us seven, oh, we'll give you two weeks. We'll fix it like normal, push out to the world, and let's go. Um, let's see how this goes. Right now, there's nothing really open, so it's all calm. Wait till school gets back in session. Oh, it is in session. We'll start finding more issues. Um, and here's how everything works. If people are curious, there's companies listed there. Um, it's all pretty well documented. Again, let's talk about this. Um, no announcements. This freaks people out. This has actually saved us. We don't assign CVs. We don't want to sign CVs. Um, there's a, like a nuclear option we might do in the future to keep other people from assigning CVs against us. We're not going to do this. There's no early announcements. Um, when Spectre meltdown happened, many governments got very concerned. I had to talk to the US government about this stuff. And they're like, why didn't you tell us? You're a US citizen. It's your job to report vulnerability issues. And I said, we didn't tell anybody. Kept it among ourselves. We fixed the problem, pushed it out. And they responded with, that's the only answer you could have given us. <laughs> um, and that's the truth. You can't tell anybody about this stuff. Because if you tell anybody, you have to tell everybody. Who's the number one user of Linux in this country? It's the French government. I trust the French government, but I have to tell the French government, but I have to tell the Dutch government, because that's where my visa is. I tell the US government. Other people might have to tell the Chinese government. If you're telling all these people, you gotta tell everybody. It just isn't an issue. So I'm gonna say this publicly. Any early notice list is just a leak. It's just a leak to everybody else. The amount, the fact, that, and they should all be considered public. It just doesn't work. Um, unless your project is not used by anybody. <laughs> and, which is true. I do know there's like a Linux Foundation project that I talked to that's like, oh, no, no, we don't have any leaks. We don't have any leaks. I'm like, maybe nobody's using you. <laughs> and here's the big thing. This is why. Why do you think your government would allow a private list that they didn't know about to be there if they're using your project? U.S. government's pretty much said that to us, so we're not going to do it. We're not going to play this game. Like the old war games quote, the only way to win is not to play the game. I'm amazed that some of the early announcement lists, like the Linux distros list, is even allowed to exist because of this. I'm probably, I'm not, gonna, I'm not a betting person. I don't know how much longer it's going to be able to be around. Linux is used by everybody. It's a core infrastructure of the world. It's very, very... It's very relied upon. It runs everything nowadays. There's bad actors. There's good actors. Everybody wants access to the bad stream. The only way to win is not to have it at all. Any comments? You guys are quiet. Heckle, come on. <laughs> Nobody's saying anything about that. Wow. I know I'm going to get some emails. All right. Um, again. Security fixes. We know we fix at least one a week. I know that. That's the thing that I know about. There's a lot of things we don't know about. Look like any other big fix. May not be known many years later. No CVs or anything. You guys know all this stuff. I've given my talk about CVs for here. Thank you. I've been able to point so many people at that talk. <laughs> I'm going to point so many people at this talk. Um, CVs mean absolutely nothing for Linux. Um, as proof of that, we're seeing companies um, send us bug fixes to, or fixes to stable. They're like, oh, this fixes the CVE. I'm like, no, it really doesn't, because you, that code wasn't even in that old kernel. You just backported it and backported away the part that wasn't even fixed. Um, people, 
Companies are now coming up with rules that said, I have to backport all CVEs to my product. And that's really interesting because you're, dic you're allowing a random government entity from probably a different country than you to dictate what your company must do and what your engineers must do, which is very interesting. Mitra wants nothing to do with kernel CVEs. They refuse to give them to me anymore. So they agree that it doesn't work for the kernel. So the few people that do sneak in the CVEs, they're doing it for the engineering processes or some other reason, um, they actually mean nothing but extra work for people. So if you ever think CVEs mean something for the kernel, they really don't. Again, talked all about this. And here's my final. I'll just leave this up here for the rest of the talk. I mean it. I will call out Oracle does a really good job. They follow the, the kernels. Android does a really good job of following the kernels. SUSE, in its weird way, actually does do a good job. <laughs> Um, rel kernels are crazy. I wouldn't do that. Debian. Again, 80% of the world at least runs Debian. Debian does a really, really good job. Um, that's it. So. Whew, 30 minutes. Done. Questions? Heckles? So um, <clears throat> say that there's a hardware issue, like if you speculate, you read all of a uh, host memory, um, and you can't fix it in hardware. Like, what kind of what kind of uh, leverage does the security team have to like force companies to fix things the right way? Because so, you know it's a lot more expensive to like fix your hardware long term, even if you can't do it in the short term. So does does the security team like do they push for that, or or is it really you know is it does it depend? I mean, so the kernel security team, the security at kernel.org, does not even get involved in the hardware issues. That's an independent group. So they don't, they don't see those. But I will point out Rowhammer. Rowhammer is known to exploit hardware, right? It's a known broken hardware. We said, hey, you might want to fix this. You might want to use ECC memory, things like that. Hardware vendors refuse to do that. The university, which is actually near me, that keeps coming up with future Rowhammer solutions on how to pound on these, DR, these chips and whatnot to break them. They're just showing this. None of this stuff is working. The hardware vendors are not fixing this. Okay. So we just get to laugh. I mean, <laughs> there's nothing we can do. Sure, we can say, hey, yeah, you do need to fix that particular bug, but, if you, yeah. but send me the patch. I mean, we work with the hardware vendors, so it's like, I'll, I'll call it Intel. Intel's really good at providing the engineers to provide the patch. The, the reason I ask is just because with, with all the Spectre vulnerabilities, like, they threw a bunch of MSRs over the wall, and we kind of had to apply them. And um, I don't know if, if people are super thrilled with that, but... Um, I guess sometimes if it's bad enough, you just, you just have to do what you have to do. Sometimes it's bad enough, that's the best thing you do. I mean, I would push back if you're buying those chips, you want a refund. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that killed a whole bunch of people's performance. I mean, you, the big cloud companies eke out 2 and 3%, and that's real, real money. And all of a sudden, you're hitting 10 15% for no good reason. Um, that's horrible. I feel really bad for you guys. Um, yeah, they were throwing MSRs over the wall. Um, if we have better ways to fix it. If you look at how we do things over time, we'll fix it better over time, and I'll backport those fixes and make it better. Um, yeah, hardware's broken. <laughs> but the job of a kernel is to paper over all the hardware bugs anyway. That's our job. So it's just another chip that's, chip that's broken. So uh, apologies in advance, uh, but don't the last four words of your quote there cover the situation? <laughs> <laughs> cover, sorry, which... Don't the last four words you put there kind of universally apply? Yeah, yeah, that's true. I mean, all hardware's broken, all software's broken, we're all human, everything's bad. Um, yeah, but your system is, all right, let's say your system is known and secure. It better be unknown and secure. Um, I'd like to go back to the hardware security issues. You're thinking, uh, in reducing uh, the embargo, embargo time to two weeks instead of I don't know how many months or, or years. Um, won't that add pressure to kernel developers? Uh, we had a talk from Thomas uh, a few years ago on, on the high pressure during Spectre and Meltdown to get everything fixed. Uh, it will basically mean uh, the same type of, of situation every time there's a hardware bug. Yeah. It, it, it well, what it will do is, hopefully, today we get, I got an email saying, hey, we found this issue, make me a mailing list so we can talk about it. Well, and then you're going to put all this one company's developers on the mailing list. You can, within your own company, 
come up with a solution, and then give it, and then if you have something that works for you, then give us two weeks to work with something. The way that a lot of these work is, they're like, nothing happens until the last week anyway. <laughs> it's just by human nature, so it, it, we're scrambling at the last minute because of deadlines and people didn't get to it before that, et cetera. So, so I don't know, we're, we'll see. It's, it's an evolving process, we'll see. I, we're gonna try and push it shorter because what we have barely works. I think you should change your code to include an up-to-date stable kernel. Because okay, yes. uh, <laughs> we've seen something like a 338 on OpenWRT years ago, and yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, fair it enough, was yes. an hour. <laughs> an up-to-date stable kernel, yes. Um, yeah, but there was a post on OSS security saying all these security, all these old kernels are actually exploitable, and here's the reason why, and they just didn't notice that we had fixed it on Saturday. So they're already up-to-date. Way. Even your up-to-date kernel is insecure. It's just less insecure. Yeah. It's just a matter of time between before yeah, like, a new bug like is Like Paul said, it's just less insecure. Yeah. 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 Oh. So you started talking about the CRA at the beginning. So what do you suggest? What do I suggest for CRA? So CRA right now is at a point where they call the trilog, where there's three different versions of the document they're being argued about and being unified. Um, the Linux Foundation has, if you go to their website, some, I don't know, tweet at your representative. Um, the, the people, there are companies and there are people lobbying to fix this. Um, I, it might be a little too late. Let's see how this resolves. Um, the good thing is, um, it might, the resolution will know what these documents really look like at the end of this year, and then we're going to have two or three more years to actually make the real rules. So worst case, if some of these don't get resolved well, we still got some more time. Um, but right now, individuals can't do much. Companies can do a little bit more. Companies need to be publicly saying, this doesn't work for us because we're an EU company and we rely on open source. Um, I think the French government needs to say we rely on open source. Uh, the German government is saying that. IBM Germany is saying that. So companies are. And that is what's going to wake up because you need the constituents of the representatives to be saying, this is actually going to hurt us. As a follow-up to the CRA question, um, is, um, are relevant people talking to you um, or is it more like you try to give input and you get mostly ignored? Um, they ignored the open source community. They actually gave a talk at FOSDEM though last year, the people who created this bill. So they know of us. Um, they tried to make it be okay with open source but failed really badly in the end. Um, their heart's in the right place. Um, Making laws is tough, um, but we do now have. There's a there's an open there's a lobbying group that is funded or is staffed by people who really know free software and open source. Uh, we trust that they're doing a good job. They know how to, the process works. They're a little bit late to the game, but they're working really hard at it. So the right people are involved with this. Um, whether that's going to be useful or not, for right now we'll see. And then again, the process for the next three years, we're going to definitely be involved. There's a whole bunch of vaguer big issues around the security issues and how that's going to be set up. Uh, they want to set up an EU version of MITRA to do their own version of the CVAs and C CD CVEs. Um, they are going to take input from like open source community, so we can get involved in that. But right now, there's, if you're not a company, there's not much you can do. Yep. Are there any uh, reproducible um, ways to reproduce the, the bugs or test suite to verify whether a kernel has all the fixes applied? for the new, issue, new issues, of course. Um, yeah, I mean, that's with the way bugs. We backport fixes to the test suites when we backport fixes all the time. You look at the eBPF patches land in the tree, um, net filter patches land in the tree, and we backport all the fixes to the tests as well. So it depends on the subsystem. Some system, systems require tests for their fixes. Uh, net filter and eBPF are really good at this. Some don't. It's up to the subsystem. Um, but yeah, that's just the way our normal development process works. Yeah, no, I meant like primary security issue that's found. Is there a way to check whether your kernel has the fix for it? Where every security, well, how do you know it was a security fix? I don't know. <laughs> um, so then just, you have to take all the patches. You just have to, I mean, I've talked about the CVE ta talk. Just take all the patches. Um, some security issues you can test for, some you can't. And, or you can just run the reproducer, right? That's told, that you find out about months later.
It's interesting how early on you said we don't really care how users use the kernel. We don't know. We don't really care. One thing we do care is that you need to update your kernel once a week. You need to qualify your kernel once a week. So in some way, we say this is a usage model. Otherwise, you're insecure. You yeah. need to qualify your out of three patches once a week. You need to have that maintenance model once a week. Yes. And it should be like a big caveat in using the kernel. If yeah. you're not able to it's follow a, that maintenance that model. That same caveat is there for using any software product. You got Microsoft's Patch Tuesday. You have our Patch Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Um, it, that's the way it is. So there is some cool tools. I know Android, and I've talked to Stephen to make a better tool about this. Um, since you're not using all the kernel, Android has a tool that matches up the stable release to what they actually build and see if there's any intersection of any changes. And they're like, oh, yeah, there's two patches. Let's look at those. Yeah, that, uh, we'll do a better review of those. Or we don't care about that. They just take it all in. But that's on you as a consumer of the kernel. And, um, yeah, but, yes, you should always update. I'd be happy if you update every two months, three months. Some Android devices are six months, and that may be a little too long. Hey, um, so uh, we both know that from time to time there will be a security researcher um, with like a root exploit um, and they say I'm going to post this like a week from now. Is it really better um, for them to post their exploit and not give vendors any time at all to to prepare for that um like no because <laughs> there isn't well, that's, enough what, that's what the cra is actually going to try and force they're going to try and force public disclosure within without fixes and that's what i have a problem with i talked about the linux distros list if you post something there you are required within two weeks to post publicly your information and your ex reproducer they are blackmailing open source projects to do work for them, for the distros. That's what the Linux distros do. The kernel security, I don't want, I can't tell you to fix my, your bug. I can't force you to do that. Um, good security practices are like the Project Zero. They report a bug to us and they say, here, I'm reporting this and the 90 day countdown starts here and we're like, the fix is here tomorrow. <laughs> um, normally it's all fast. We want, we're not trying to hold on to bugs. Some bugs have taken us what, 12 months? I think we actually had a security bug with, oh, the, the networking. Was that two years? Anyway, some of these bugs we constantly work on, and we're working with the researchers. We, we aren't, normally people who report stuff to us are not trying to blackmail us. They honestly want to see the problem fixed, which is good, and we work with them and do that. I don't think we've ever, the kernel security team that I remember have ever been held hostage like that. The Linux distros list holds us hostage. That's why the kernel security team refuses to work with the Linux distros list anymore, because they're holding projects hostage. The curl team also has publicly talked about this. The Linux distro list hold them hostage. Uh, at, at, at some point, I think um, the security team had like a person that would notify the, the distros list um, when there was a patch and like so, some days in advance so that distros would have the time to roll out their, their patch. But uh, correct me if I'm wrong, like I think Android has a, a monthly patch cycle, which yeah. means when the researcher posts their exploit, it means that like 99% of uh, Linux devices are going to be vulnerable for two weeks and on average. It, is that really the, like, the best way to do things? I, I don't think so. I think, you know, I will call out Project Zero as doing it right. If you look at how, what their rules are and how they say to do things, I think that's the best way to deal with the people who are not, they're just ignoring us, companies like ignoring security issues versus blackmail of you have to fix this tomorrow. That's a, 90 days is a good middle ground, right? Um, and then usually even Project Zero, they'll announce that there was a problem, but they don't do an exploit. Here's how you reproduce it until Android's updated, per se. I mean, that's, that's a good way to do it. It's up to you as a researcher. I can't tell you what to do as a researcher, but just don't blackmail me. <laughs> okay, so, so Project Zero is, is Google. Um, yeah. Independent of Android. They're just a different team out there. Yeah, sure, and, but do you trust them not to tell governments? Um, I have no idea. I am not privy to that. That's up to them. I'm not. I know government entities tell us about security bugs. I'll tell you that. 
we have government entities telling us about that. And they usually require horrible ways to interact with them with emails that we can never handle. Um, but we know that happens, which is good. They're trying to get bugs fixed. Um, I'm, not, I'm not reporting issues to <laughs> government entities, but I'm happy when they report them to us. Um, and as far as, um, yes, we did used to have somebody that would post things to Linux distros. Um, that developer stopped doing that. It was just on their own time. They said it wasn't worth it, and they don't do it anymore. That was up to them. Um, and again, early disclosure, it just didn't really work out. There's a lot of lawyers involved. <laughs> so if anybody wants me to get an early disclosure, I tell them to talk to my lawyer. <laughs> So, um, a quick question. Um, the security mailing list uh, is private, so and people post patches there. And um, how will those patches then be reviewed by the broader community? Is there a process for this, or is, there, is this a private review and then they are uh, landing private in the Linux kernel, or is it So a traditionally, I'll, I'll take an example of a NetFilter bug. So NetFilter had a number of issues. Project, uh, Google had a bug bounty program bunch of NetFilter bugs were found. They reported to us, we drug in the NetFilter developers, NetFilter developers said, hey, you're right, here's a bug, here's a fix. And then they posted the fix publicly on their mailing list, their developer mailing list, other developers, the maintainers, reviewed it as, hey, here's a bug fix for this. Not talking about how it's exploitable, or how things like they can crash or whatever. Developers merged it to the public tree, all went well, picked up the stable kernels, everybody's happy. The, reprodu or the people who found the bug actually got real money from Google. Everybody was happy. Um, Google does a really good job in paying out bounties. I will call that out. They do a good job. Um, that's a good example of how things are doing. We try to post things publicly whenever we can because it's really obvious when a patch goes in that it's like authored by me, signed off by Linus, applied directly to his tree. <laughs> sure. Um, uh, so we try and avoid that. But it does happen sometimes. Especially that it is not, isn't a fast lane into, uh, into getting stuff into the kernel. Maybe people, avoid, uh, maybe people use the kernel security stuff to get their stuff moved. Uh, no, we do not put it yeah. up with that. No. And this is not a mailing list, it's just an alias. So there's no record, there's no archives hosted anywhere. So it's not a mailing list. It's just, again, it's a post fix exploder alias file. So nothing's held on any server anywhere for this type of stuff. So yeah, uh, a few remarks on uh, those timing questions. So there are a few contexts uh, which we need to keep in mind. So one is fairness when it comes to like disclosure and you know patching things. Um, that one week example I think is maybe a bit unfair because you can't expect everyone to be that quick, even though many people are. But might be a bit short. But we're I not telling we you that this was a bug, a security issue. We're just uh, getting sure. immersed in the Linux tree in the week. Sure. I mean, what, what you're, I just agree with what you're saying, that it's fair what Project Zero is doing, like 90 days. On the other hand, you know, when it comes to fairness, some vendors are also known to not reply within three months, so that can also be a bit of an issue, right? So I would guess Project Zero is like the medium ground. And now the other thing is, um, when it comes to distribution, so we can't expect everyone in the very same second, right, to always upgrade their kernel to like latest, that doesn't really make sense. And at the same time, you know, we, we just have these long supply chains in many places, especially in the embedded world, you know, where people rely on like SDKs and it really takes time to propagate patches. So I think we just need to deal with the fact that not everything will always be up to date, so we just need to be reasonable. Yeah, that's the only proper solution. Just update everything all the time. And test it all. Test everything all. If you can't test this stuff, then you have bigger problems. Uh, I would like to to add some points, uh, which are that um, first, uh, the vast majority of the security bugs or uh, security fixes do not pass via the security list. So it's very important because uh, there are tensions between different groups uh, regarding early notifications, etc. But uh, it's the same as the CVE. I mean that uh, even if there was uh, a systematic forward or notification or whatever of some issues after some time, it would encourage some groups to only watch this and ignore all the rest. Yeah. And uh, it's a big problem. Also, this list is, 
is mostly a service to reporters and not even to developers because in fact we notice that a lot of reporters are scared to send uh, a notification uh, a bug report to the wrong person and by sending them to this list for them it's an insurance that they are not doing something wrong and the vast majority of the time uh, we just forward the patches to the maintainer so uh, the, the list is just uh, there to uh, to reassure these people, say, okay, you sent to the right place, so now it's forwarded. Some of them are just fixed publicly, some of them are fixed privately and pushed later, but uh, there is no such thing as an early notification which is possible. However, I think that maybe we could do a better job with Linux distros. I don't know how, to be honest, because uh, there seems to be uh, a lot of uh, desire uh, from this list to, uh, to be notified about a lot of things. And I saw that they made some efforts to relax a little bit their rules, but I think that they wrongly assume that we know about all the security issues, which is not the case, in fact. Yeah. That's a simple thing, we don't know the security. I mean, look at all, networking refused to be involved in the security mailing yeah, list for, for the longest time. They would just refuse. They'll give a bug report, don't even report it there, report it to the public mailing list, let's work that way. So networking, still, most of the network security bugs are just coming in through the normal feed of bugs. So yeah, don't, that's what Linus was trying to say in 2008. Don't think one is more important than the other. We don't know, we don't care. They're bug fixes, we need to do them all. And the early reporting Linux distros, I just don't think that's going to survive much longer. At least what we could probably do is to, uh, to update the, um, the how to, the, the doc uh, submitting bugs, or I don't remember its name. Uh, maybe to, uh, to explain the situation better uh, <coughs> to the, the reporters to encourage them to report there, but just uh, make sure that there is no problem anymore with not having an early notification. I mean, uh, if the reporter wants to notify Linux distros, say, hey, for your information, I pushed this upstream, it fixes this issue, and if you want the reproducer, it's here, probably it will help them already. But uh, uh, right now, it's difficult because of this uh, this disagreement on the delay or early notification or whatever. We are not going to sit on a bug just so that it remains embargoed anyway. Yep, yeah, that's a hard, that's a hard issue. I agree, but that's assuming people read our documentation, which we know they don't. <laughs> we keep getting people, I want a CVE. You give us CVEs, right? No. Um, uh, on, the, on the topic about how long to wait for the embargoed security issues, I've been involved with most of them. If you wait too long, that's bad because, I mean, at some point the fixes would be there and nobody would, uh, all, a, a small amount of people would, people would review them and I would just take them and start applying them so that distros could start bar backporting. Yeah. If you do a couple of weeks, that's also too short because some of the fixes are really hard. I agree. So we need to find, some, 90 maybe. days sounds good. Yeah, maybe we'll figure we it out. We can try let's, it. Let's see what happens on the next one. That we yeah. have. We'll Shh, there's no next one. <laughs> <laughs> there's not a next one. Everything, always a next everything one. has been broken and fixed. Now. Everything, oh, all right, the, everything that we know of is fixed. Yeah, everything. Well, everything <laughs> that I, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Everything's always broken. <laughs> you just have to admit it all works as designed. Yeah. All works as designed. Yeah, these were designed to do this. Yeah, these chips were designed to cheat. Which, uh, to be fair, I mean, that's the interesting thing about security. I will, I'll call out also, older kernels were not designed with a threat model that newer kernels are. We now don't trust USB devices. In the beginning, we always did. We now don't trust CPUs. <laughs> In the beginning, we did. That's a threat model change that the world is, is now switched to think about, and so we need to be aware that newer kernels provide the airbags and the fixes for those newer ideas. Those will never go to older kernels. Greg. If we could uh, switch gears back to LTS away from the security a little bit, <laughs> um, you know, getting patches that apply back to older stable trees is easy when there's no conflicts. Sometimes there's conflicts. And many times those upstream patches, there's not a regression test for it. It's, you know, obviously a good patch and, you know, it, it got into upstream. What's your expectation for the amount of testing that should be done on a conflict resolution patch for an older kernel that's a patch that we want to get into an older LTS branch? Um, 
I trust that the people sending me backports has done the test. So if it doesn't apply cleanly, I reject it and say, throw up my hands and say, it's up to you. One rule of the stable kernels and the long-term kernels that we made in the very beginning is we will not bother any upstream developer to have to do this. We do not want to add any additional work. So they don't have to do this. We have some upstream developers that refuse to participate. That's wonderful. That's up to them. So distros that backport these patches, I want to say, please at least test them. That being said, I have a lot of distros and a lot of requests saying, please backport this patch. And it just doesn't even build. So it's like there's a disconnect of them even saying it solves a problem for them when they obviously never even tested it. So I trust them. And I'll call out Oracle, VMware, or Huawei. Do a really good job of providing me with backported tested patches. It's hard. It's a hard job to do. Um, so there are people that are doing that good job. Yeah. Um, Android does a good job too as well. I think I actually ran out of time. Well, thank you very much.